Greetings. <clears throat> this is a sermon for Sunday, December the 6th, the second Sunday in Advent, 2020. And I welcome you. Thank you for joining me uh, in this Advent quest, this journey in which we engage together that leads us to the celebration of the birth of Christ on Christmas. I've entitled the sermon this morning, The Bethlehem Candle of Peace. It's traditional to light the peace candle on the second Sunday of Advent. So I'm reading from two of the prophets, one from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 to 5, these words. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. What a message of hope for Israel. And then from Isaiah chapter 9, we read these words that we've all heard. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Charlie Brown is an oft-quoted philosopher of Charles Schultz's Peanuts frame, a cartoon strip of old that our young people probably don't even know, but I will remember forever. Charlie once made an astute, astute observation regarding these days that lead up to Christmas, and I know I've shared this story before. Charlie Brown said this is the season to be wishy-washy. <laughs> he observed that with a facial expression that always spoke of some sense of being brought up short. He made the statement after having taunted and teased his sister, whom he found one day writing a letter to Santa Claus, the frames of the comic strip showed Lucy so concentrated on her writing to Santa that he did, she didn't even realize that Charlie was nearby. She didn't notice his unconstrained laughter, his bouncing off the walls as he asked her, Are you sending your letter to the North Pole? Tee -hee. Are you telling him you'll leave him some cookies and milk on Christmas Eve? Giggle, giggle. And with each question, Charlie Brown bellows out more laughter. Finally, Lucy looks up and notices his presence for the first time. She says, oh, Charlie Brown, I'm writing a letter to Santa. Would you like me to include any requests for you? And Charlie gets a strange, serious look on his face. And he says, well, tell him I'd like a new ball glove and a new sweater and remind him that we don't have a fireplace and have to come in through the window on Christmas Eve. And then... In Charlie Brown's characteristic silly half grin, he looks out to his reader and says, "'Tis the season to be wishy-washy." That cartoon strip for me is something like the singing of Silent Night on Christmas Eve. It's good to do over and over and over again, maybe every year, because Charlie Brown's amazingly infinite wisdom in encapsulating the human condition Every year as we enter into the season of Advent, it is a season to be wishy-washy. This is a season of a year when we say a lot of good stuff. We send out cards with inspirational messages that talk about love and hope and joy and peace. And we light candles in our worship services. Today, the second Sunday in Advent, we light the candle of peace. Yet, we must ask ourselves, peace. Peace, where is peace? We are confronted by our various forms of media that speak of the reign of violence in so many ways, the, the rumors of war, 
You know, it's seriously perplexing in these past post-election days in the United States to hear folks like an election official from the great state of Georgia this past week imploring policymakers in high places in his state to stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed, he said. Enough. This has got to stop. The official was responding to the fact that one of his election workers had actually received specific death threats. It's got to stop, the official said. This Christian liturgical season of Advent reminds us of a, of a person, reminds us as a person of Christian faith that it is one thing to talk about love and joy and peace and to send out Christmas cards with the Holy Family on the front, a message of hope inside. It's something profoundly different to live out those values and virtues each day in our lives. And it's one thing to claim to be followers of the Prince of Peace. It's something else to demonstrate the message of peace as we live out our days. Demonstrate, I said. It's not easy to be messengers of peace in a society where hate messages and violence threats run rampant. How easy it is to become wishy-washy during this Advent season. Charlie Brown, you hit the nail on the head. And that's why I keep quoting you, Charlie. Your wisdom is no longer available on the Sunday morning comic pages, so I feel personally responsible for helping to keep your message alive, Charlie Brown. You've heard me say this before, friends. Our lives are like billboards. We bear messages day in and day out by the things that we say and the actions that we take. A year or so ago, the donut shop just around the corner from where I live put up a sign in their marquee. It said, enjoy our donuts in a smoke-free environment. A few days later, the smoke shop, just a half a block away, put up a sign on their marquee that said, enjoy our smokes in a donut-free environment. I loved it. And I had to laugh, and I asked myself seriously, I wonder what's worse, what's the most damaging to the human body, smoke or donuts? It's probably a toss-up. You ever think about the messages that you and I communicate on our marquees? The way we communicate with others, our lives are kind of like billboards. It's been proven over and over again in our history that evil, though, can be confronted in ways that do not violate our faith convictions. All the major religions of the world give the same preeminence to the virtue of peace. The Brethren Church has seen itself as a peace church from its very inception. And the Disciples of Christ Church once passed a resolution that I remember very clearly saying, we want to be like the Church of the Brethren. We want to go on record as a peace church. It's one thing to be a peace lover. It's something else and much more complicated to be a peacemaker. You ever think about the messages that you send, that you communicate in the way you speak, the way you talk, and the actions that you take? A year or so ago, there was an art exhibit in the gallery at Washburn University's Mulvane Art Museum. It was an expose about using the multitude of art forms to demonstrate how Religious intolerance has precipitated horrific acts of inhumanity right here in our country. The title of the museum, the, um, the uh, exhibit was, quote, speaking volumes, transforming hate. The gallery was literally filled 
with volumes of hate-filled literature published by the creativity movement in Montana in the 1970s. One of the images in the gallery by which I was most moved was a number of military ammunition boxes filled with volumes of the white man's Bible written by the creation movement leader, Ben Klassen. The display was a reminder of how the Bible, sacred literature, and extremist views have been used by practitioners of religious faith as ammunition to prompt violent uprisings throughout our history and to continue to do so to this day. One very well-noted evangelical church leader just this past week made the comment <clears throat> that some Christians are tied into demonic demonic expressions of faith. And quite frankly, I took it a little bit with offense because of the people that he was pointing out. It's not good. There are people in our community that carry signs around that say, God hates you. And when I see them, I look at the message and I read it and I ponder it and I thought to myself, you have the right to hate people. Yeah, you do. We all have the right to hate people. We all right, have the right to carry signs that say God hates, unless, of course, that you just might happen to be in the line of pilgrims who look to the star of Bethlehem and who claim that the manger babe, the prince of peace is your savior and your Lord, then you can't carry signs of hate. Your billboard must not communicate violence, hostility. This morning, we light the candle of peace. As a community of faith, we believe God came into the world in the form of a vulnerable child, and he is called the Prince of Peace. Furthermore, <clears throat> we believe that we have been called to be agents of reconciliation as disciples of the Prince of Peace. We have our work cut out for us, folks. <clears throat> we all have to admit and confess that peace seems to be an illusion sometimes, a dream far from the reality of the real world. I think surely all of the world would have to see, would love to see the world at peace. There's a logical answer to the question, though, how we do that. And it's been proven over and over again. Evil can be confronted in ways that do not violate our Christian convictions. One of the elders in one of my former congregations shared a story with me some time ago about being a part of the Freedom March on Washington, D.C. in 1963. She shared with me about how she was coached to walk in that march and not to be distracted by the hecklers and the haters on the roadside. How she walked hand in hand down the street with a black woman who, when angry crowds were shouting from the sidelines, held firmly to Barb's hand and said to her again and again, don't you look over there. Don't you say a word. Don't you turn your head. Walk on, walk on, she said. Wow, what a story. Don't turn your head. Don't give evil a chance to be confronted. The evil of hatred, racism, which is exactly what I believe Jesus taught us to walk the other way, to, 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 to not turn our heads toward it. The evil of hatred and racism was confronted with nonviolent engagement. And that's what Jesus taught. I'm reminded of a true story shared by a pastor that accents our role of bringing peace into this kingdom of ours of which the prophets dream. Pastor tells the story of being shanghaied by one of his Sunday school teachers one Sunday morning at the top of the basement stairs. She said, I need your help, and I need your help right now. 
and the tone of her voice made him aware she wasn't kidding. She was in need. She took me by the arm and she led me to her class. <clears throat> I could see immediately what she was talking about. The pastor said, a little boy dressed up as a shepherd boy and he was using his staff to hold the entire class at bay. He was swinging his staff around while all the rest of the class members were cowering in one corner of the room. And the pastor said, give me the stick. From well out of range. The 12-year-old looked back at the pastor and shouted an obscenity in. The pastor walked closer. He held out his hand. Peter swung the shepherd's crook. And the pastor caught it in his hand. And yes, the pastor said it hurt. But I hung on. And so did Peter. I pulled him toward me. I pulled him toward me and I threw both of my arms around him. And I held him in a bear hug while he struggled. And he struggled and he struggled. He yelled profanity at me all of the time. I simply hung on. My arms wrapped around him. And eventually his struggling and his curses dissolved into tears. And he released his hold on the staff. And gradually the bear hug turned into a human hug. You're going to beat the pants off of me, the little boy said, aren't you? And the pastor said, well... Why would I do that, Peter? Because, he said, that's what my dad always does. Does he do that to you often, Peter? The pastor asked. Yeah, he comes home drunk all the time. And he beats me and my mom and everybody except my baby brother. Peter, the pastor said, I don't want to beat you. I want to be your friend. And Peter said, nobody wants to be my friend. Whenever I get a friend, I hit him, and then we're not friends anymore. And Peter began to cry again. By this time, Peter was sitting on the pastor's lap, enveloped in the pastor's hug. Are they going to kick me out of the church play, he asked. Well, Peter, the pastor said, we'd like you to be in the play, but we just can't have you hitting people with your shepherd's crook. Can you promise not to hit people? And Peter said, no. Because when I get a stick like that in my hand, I just start hitting people. I don't even know why. And the pastor said, maybe I can help. Tell you what, he said. I will sit on the front row during the Christmas play. And when you feel like hitting someone with your shepherd's crook, you just look at me like this. And then we'll both pretend that I'm giving you a big, warm bear hug. Do you think that'd work? And Peter nodded affirmatively. Throughout the pageant that night, Peter kept looking over at the pastor sitting there in the front row, and they exchanged knowing glances. And the pageant was one of the best ever. In looking back over the incident, the pastor made the comment, you know, sometimes it seems to me that maybe that's what God's like. Sitting there in the front row of our lives, smiling, encouraging us on, reminding us of who we are and to whom we belong. And that makes such a difference in how we live out our lives. God, sitting there in the front row, urging us on encouraging us to be the agents of reconciliation in the peaceable kingdom, to be born from within with peace. The song that we will hear later on in the service carries this phrase. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. I think peace begins from within, don't you? That's what peace is, in fact. We must believe that it can be taken from this place to transform disparity on our streets, anger and hostility in the political realm, divisiveness in our church and our community, into love in the hearts of people, here and all over the world. My prayer is, friends, that this Bethlehem candle of peace will light a path for you.
and show you the way to demonstrate God's shalom every day of your life. May it be so.